Welcome to Car and Driver. You know, being able to hit 150 is one thing. Doing it quickly is very impressive, but stopping from that speed is a whole nother story entirely. Welcome to our zero to 150 to zero test. Car and Driver first ran this test in 1998, positioning it as a new performance benchmark. It was an evolution of the zero to 100 to zero test that became popular in the 1960s. After all, with modern vehicles getting more powerful and more aerodynamic, why not raise the stakes? Invites went out to stock cars like the NSX, the Viper and the Corvette, and modified vehicles from Saline and Hennessy. The winning vehicle was a Lingenfelter Chevy Corvette ZR1 with 640 horsepower, and it ran the test in 23.3 seconds. The zero to 150 to zero performance benchmark standardization never really happened. The problem? Well, you need a lot of space to do this test, which is why we headed north to a Skoda Wordsmith Airport and its 2.2 miles of freshly paved taxiway. Our testing process and hardware have changed a lot since 1998. While back then they were using a fifth wheel attached to the vehicle's exterior, now we have sophisticated GPS data loggers that record a vehicle's position 100 times per second. We also use a trigger attached to the brake pedal of each vehicle that captures the braking performance or process from the pedal application, not just from when the vehicle starts slowing. And overall, we get a more complete picture of a vehicle's performance. As for the runs themselves, we didn't want to make theoretical runs by combining the best acceleration with the best possible braking. We treated it like what would happen at a track day, and your lap is your lap, or your run in this case is your run, and it's on the driver to make it happen. We also didn't subtract a one foot rollout from acceleration or apply weather correction. That means the acceleration figures quoted here aren't comparable to other test results. Also remember that the 60 mile an hour acceleration matters less than the time it takes to go from 100 to 150. The Civic Type R is a great example of why. As our driver improved 60 mile an hour times run after run, the 100 to 150 time grew worse. The limiters? Heat, aerodynamics, and gearing. The Type R had a lead over the Elantra N at 100, but remember that the Honda is optimized for road courses where 150 isn't common hence the wing and the gap between gears fifth and sixth. That upshift happens at about 145 miles an hour, at which point drag temporarily gains an advantage. Once finally at 150, the track ready brakes bring the Civic to a stop in 674 feet, good for sixth place overall. That's also 46 feet shorter than the best stopping car from 1998 a Chevrolet Corvette. <laughs> the Elantra N has 39 fewer horsepower than the Type R, and it took 36 feet longer to stop from 150. Why was it quicker? 
Well, it doesn't have a big wing hanging off the trunk. Aerodynamic drag increases with the square of speed, and it's surely one of the reasons why the Elantra pulled ahead of the Civic by more than five seconds at 150. That, plus you can flat shift it. Despite recording one of the longer stops, the brakes felt stable and strong. Overall, we're tickled that for 34 grand, you can buy a four-door sedan that can take you to 150 miles an hour and back without a shrug. Compared to the manual front drivers, Launching the automatic all-wheel drive Golf R was easy. This will become a trend for the rest of the cars, by the way. Put the Golf R in its special drive mode, push on the gas and the brake, rev it up, and go. The Golf hit 60 miles an hour in four and a half seconds, and a buck 50 required 33.3 seconds. Going straight meant there was little opportunity to touch the capacitive steering wheel buttons accidentally, so that was nice. The Golf's brakes felt the same every time, essentially duplicating the Type R's stopping performance and erasing 150 miles an hour in 6.2 seconds. True to its origins, the hatchback from the land of the Autobahn felt like it was happy to stay at 150 for as long as we pleased. The Bentayga was even easier. There's no launch control, so you just mash the gas and the brake and go and brace for a violent one-two upshift. The 542-horsepower V8 is healthy enough to muscle to 150 in 25.7 seconds, but that's when the drama starts. Despite a respectable stop of 694 feet, the Bentayga was unhappy, let's say, about shedding that much speed in one go. The brake odor was enough to overwhelm the smell of that plush leather. Don't get us wrong, we're impressed. In horsepower terms, stopping the Bentley in six and a half seconds equates to an average of over 1,100 horsepower, but it shows that it's possible to excel at something while letting everyone know that you don't particularly enjoy doing it. If the all-electric EV6 were part of our 1998 test, it would have beaten every stock vehicle, including the Dodge Viper. What's better is launching it couldn't be simpler. Press the GT button to enable all 576 horsepower, slam the go pedal, and you're off. Scrambling to 150 didn't use as much battery as you'd think, about 5% per pass, 2% of which returns with a long, regen-friendly stop. And from 150, the brakes felt good, but required the longest in-test stop of 756 feet. Remember, EVs are heavy. With an 11.8 second quarter mile pass, the EV6 is reminiscent of the Bentayga. More motor than brakes, but still putting up a solid result. Compared to the EV6, a rather unexpected rival, the Supra was notably slower to 60, but reeled in the EV at higher speed. It closed the gap to less than half a second at 150, and then clawed back a half second under braking. What's interesting is that the Supra's low speed agility that makes it such fun on twisty roads also means unsettling jitters at high speeds. It starts at about 120 as the Supra starts sniffing the edges of the lane. Stability returns under braking, but we were glad for the wide expanse of the taxiway as we near 150. Still pretty good. Mustang was run strong out there today. We got the Pirelli Trofeo RS as we're hooking up. Uh, Brembo brakes, six pistons in the front, four in the rear. Yeah, yeah, the Schlitz Dark Horse running real good today. We're feeling good about our chances tomorrow in the All-Star Race. And, um, you know, we just got to we just gotta run our race and not get wrecked again by Chastain. We're going to fight that guy. 
Our team has tested plenty of Mustangs, so an acceleration run on the Dark Horse was a familiar exercise. With a 12.6 second quarter mile pass, it went pretty much as expected right until you hit the brakes and your eyeballs get sucked out of your head. Get this, the Dark Horse outbraked both the Corvette Z06 and 911 Turbo S, posting a preposterous 569 foot stop from 150 miles an hour. That's the second best of the group. Credit those super sticky Pirelli P0 Trofeo RS tires and those six piston Brembos up front. Now, Dark Horse owners are probably gonna bolt on all manner of aftermarket modifications. We recommend not touching the brakes. You expect the GT Speed to be quick, it's in the name after all, but it's hard to fathom how 5,045 pounds can launch like this. The Speed uses an eight-speed dual-clutch transmission with real-deal launch control, with a 5,000 RPM engagement lobbing the twin-turbo six-liter W12 650 horsepower down to the pavement. The GT Speed still pulls hard at 150, which is reached in 18.1 seconds behind only the Turbo S and Z06. Its 680-foot stop isn't particularly impressive until you consider the immensity of this thing. And then you realize why it has carbon ceramic rotors and 10-piston front calipers. We'll miss this W12 power plant. With 668 horsepower going to just two wheels, traction on a Skoda's fresh pavement posed the biggest challenge to the CT5V Blackwing. We kept dialing down the launch control, all the way down to 1300 RPM, and there was still a whole lot of torque modulation going up through first gear. But the Caddy set the fourth quickest 150 mile an hour time, and its track-worthy brakes shrugged off that speed in 664 feet, feeling like they'd be happy to keep doing so all day long. Boom! The Blackwing didn't beat the GT3 RS, but the fact that it got within a few tenths of a second confirms its position as one of the ultimate sports sedans ever built. The 911 GT3 RS wasn't the quickest car of this test, but it sure sounded like it. It was always a worthy spectacle, the GT3 chattering at 6,500 RPM before shrieking off the line and kissing 9,000 RPM on its way down the tarmac. Unlike the Cadillac, the GT3 RS's launch control was unwilling to learn and unable to be adjusted. Just easing onto the throttle without it was about as quick on this less grippy surface. Despite active aerodynamics that dial in a low downforce mode when the GT3 is pointed straight and accelerating, the Porsche was slower to 150 than both the GT Speed and Blackwing. But when it's time to hit the brakes, the GT3 RS practically chokes its driver with a seatbelt, stopping in 5.2 seconds and 514 feet. The brakes grab so hard that it's simply disorienting. Like the GT3, the Z06 is a road course car, not a drag racer, but its performance here proved that that orientation doesn't get in the way. Its launch control is manually adjustable, but we got the best time in auto mode, letting the car learn the surface and adjust accordingly. As you'd hope, 
The brakes are stupendous, too. beat the GT3 RS by almost two seconds, but its margin was narrower against the Lingenfelter Corvette ZR1 from 1998, which completed the test just 0.8 seconds behind the Z06. Think about that. A naturally aspirated C4 Corvette 25 years ago could beat a modern Porsche GT3 RS and nearly hang with a C8 Z06. Makes you wonder what those Lingenfelter folks could do with a C8. Turbo S required less than a half mile to hit 150 and return to a stop. Setup was easy, select sport mode which keeps the active front and rear spoilers in their low drag position, then hit the sport response button to increase the launch control threshold from 4000 to 5000 RPM. After that, hang on. S reached the quarter mile in 10 and a half seconds and 150 in 13.5 seconds. It was so fast, in fact, that the biggest challenge was hitting the brakes at exactly 150. The 586 foot stop, by the way, was third best behind the Mustang and GT3 RS. The Turbo S was the only car here that had us eyeing our taxiway and wondering if it could reach 200. We aired up the tires to the setting recommended in the manual and set off to find out. What do you think he's he going to get? He got 197 yesterday. 197. If he comes back without a two as the first digit, it's a big fail. Okay. All right. What is he in? He actually has it on his goals for his performance review this year to go 200. So today's the day. expectations. <laughs> I just keep being the guinea pig, setting the 200 bar, and yeah. everyone's gonna go above it. Yeah. All right, who's next? Like is <laughs> predictions. 200. All right. Still getting. Oh, he beat me. What? Do you... <laughs> 201.38. Oh. All right. 201.38. And with that, the Porsche 911 Turbo S wins our 0 to 150 to 0 contest. But you're probably already saying, where's the Tesla Model S Plaid or the Lucid Air Sapphire? Well, we rented a Plaid, but it showed up with a nail in its tire. Worse, the rental service was unable to replace that tire in time. When we finally got it back the following week, we ran it at our normal test facility, which doesn't allow the use of cameras. Adding insult to injury, this Plaid didn't have the $20,000 track package with its upgraded wheels, tires, and carbon ceramic rotors. Our car had the base 19-inch Pirelli P0 PZ4s. Surely this handicap would limit its performance, right? Nope, but we'll get to that. Ditto for the 1,234 horsepower Lucid Air Sapphire. When we found ourselves at Virginia International Raceway a few weeks later with such car, 
we figured we might as well make a few 0 to 50 to 0 passes. Since we were already adding asterisks, what's the harm in a few more? Both EVs ran more than three seconds quicker than the 911 Turbo S. Their advantage? Acceleration. The Plaid got to 150 in 9.7 seconds and the Sapphire a second quicker still, putting them a few seconds ahead of the 911 Turbo. That edge more than offsets their stopping distances, which thanks to their hefty curb weights, were roughly 100 feet longer. That hurt their overall times though by less than a second. Where does that leave us overall? Well, different locations and days mean we can't name a conclusive winner. Hell, the Lucid was breaking uphill. Another asterisk then. What we are certain about is that even if we don't wait 25 years to do this test again, it's highly unlikely that an internal combustion car could come out on top ever again.